In August 1940, the third month of the German occupation, I thought up a new plan to escape into the free zone. All I took with me was a rucksack with a few essentials as I boarded the train for Moulin. When the train pulled slowly into a small station about 30 kilometers from Moulin, I saw that it was almost deserted. There were no German troops in sight. I got off and I followed the road to the demarcation line. To my horror, I saw that the checkpoint was swarming with German guards. It seemed hopeless, but I was determined not to turn back. I decided to follow a route along the river, and after trekking along roads and through fields for about four hours, came across a farmer's field where I could rest. Scanning the area with my binoculars, I noticed that the German observation posts thinned out into the distance. I watched the Germans every move for hours until my hands were numb. Eventually, I saw a definite pattern. At regular intervals, the guards walked to the next post and stopped to chat. I prepared to spend the night in the field, fortified by the sandwiches my aunt had made for me. It felt like the longest night of my life. By the time dawn broke, it was five o'clock, and, and when, when I, I looked, looked through my binoculars, to my surprise, there were no Germans anywhere. By some strange miracle, they had all vanished, leaving me free to escape across the river. I picked up my rucksack and cautiously moved closer. When I was sure that it was deserted, I went straight to the river, took off all my clothes, packed them into the rucksack, and strapped it tightly across my shoulders. With one final look around to be sure that I was alone, I dove into the frigid river. The sudden shock left me gasping for air, and my cumbersome rucksack made every stroke more laborious. I could only swim short distances before running out of breath. My arms soon felt as heavy as lead. The realization that the Germans might spot me at any moment gave me the impetus to keep going. By the time I was within the reach of the free zone, my strength began to fade. I was so exhausted that I could only occasionally kick my legs. At, At the, the very, very moment, moment when my strength off. almost gave out completely, I summoned one last burst of energy and fought off my fatigue. Before long, I found myself grasping the shores of the unoccupied zone of France and my entry into freedom. My name is Max Bornstein. I've written my memoirs. The title of the book is If Home Is Not Here. I was born in Warsaw, Poland, came to Canada in 1923, lived in Winnipeg, Manitoba for 10 years, following which we went to join my father in Paris, France. My first memories are actually as a child in Canada, living with my loving mother. We applied to go back to Canada a year after we came to France. Even though we lived here 10 years, and even though my sister was a born Canadian, we were forbidden to return to Canada. When Hitler marched into Paris, the Germans had other plans for me. After numerous attempts, I finally escaped and made it to Marseille, where I worked with a refugee organization I crossed the Pyrenees to Spain on foot, but before I could make it to Portugal to be reunited with my family in Argentina, I was arrested and imprisoned by the Spanish police. How do you describe hell? That, that's what it was like. We arrive in a camp called Miranda de Ebro. This was a concentration camp that consisted of 900 prisoners, ranging from British prisoners who escaped from France, French citizens who wanted to join the goal, Czech citizens, Polish, Belgium. And we went from one quarry to another. It was an extremely, very hard physical work. And, it, and if you didn't, uh, uh, walk fast enough, you could get the butt of the rifle in your back. Everybody was hungry. I used to weigh around 130 or something. When I came out, I only weighed 
roughly 80 pounds plus, we found ourselves to be 90 Jews amongst the 900 prisoners. We were a wonderful community that were very close and helpful to each other. And there was one Jew in particular, his name was Capitaine Darzas. Thanks to his uh, uh, intervention, I got released a little earlier than I thought I would be, because I didn't know, you know, I thought I was going to be left there till the end of the war. When I first landed in England, I felt for the first year or so, I felt perfectly normal and enjoyed the, uh, uh, the freedom that I was given. Having landed in a country where I knew no one and had no family or friends for that matter, became increasingly difficult for me to handle until I suffered a nervous breakdown. <laughs> what can a person in my situation say except thank God that I remained alive? I was able to get married to a wonderful woman and raise two wonderful children. Of course, my wife, my children, suffered because of my experiences, and I never did get fully recovered. That is the honest truth. <laughs> Describing what the Holocaust survivors went through is a matter of utmost importance. Not because it was my story, because it was the story of the people that I've known and lived with, that was their, my story and their story, and the ones who didn't survive. If you gave me a million dollars, I wouldn't be this happy as, as knowing that my book is going to be published. This meant my very life to me. <laughs>